across the fence paying tribute to winter with the Vermont man who taught us that no two snowflakes are alike. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. It's obviously been a weird winter weather-wise. There's far less snow than normal and that would have made Wilson Bentley's job even tougher. Wilson Bentley was better known as Snowflake Bentley. He was a self-educated farmer from Jericho who attracted world attention for his work in science, meteorology, and photography. Rebecca Gollin tells us more about Bentley and the art of winter as captured in a museum exhibition. Who was Wilson Bentley? Oh my gosh, who was Wilson? He was a farmer, a dreamer, a self-taught photographer and scientist and weather expert and a musician and a, so many different people all rolled into one. He was Sue Richardson about is the great great niece of Jericho native Wilson Bentley, known to Vermonters and snow enthusiasts as Snowflake Bentley. He died before she was born, but the stories about him lived on in the family, and she continues to share them with the public. When he was 15 years old, his mother, who had been a school teacher, gave him a microscope. And this opened up a whole new world to him. He looked at everything under the microscope, leaves, blades of grass, insects, and of course, when winter came, snowflakes. And once he saw just the delicate beauty, it captured his attention, it just captivated him. As the first person to devise a technique to photograph an individual snowflake in 1885, Bentley went on to capture thousands of glass plate photomicrographs of snow crystals. Some of those images are part of an exhibit at the Shelburne Museum that's putting winter on display. 32 degrees, the art of winter, it breaks down the elements of snow and ice through the lens of artists. The multimedia show covers a broad time frame, from historical to contemporary. On display are paintings and photographs, as well as more unusual components, such as video and sound installations, snow globes, and a video game. Snow and ice have been depicted in art for millennia. And it's something that's very familiar to artists and to ourselves, as it's inherent in nature. Uh, but it's something that's so rich and complex. The show is broken into three subsections, moving from the aesthetics of snow, including Bentley's snowflakes, to the physicality of snow, looking at its temporary nature and the way it moves through time and space. The last section, associations, takes on conceptual notions of snow and ice, leading the viewer past images, objects, and experiences that are both familiar and abstract to evoke nostalgia and narrative. In this section are Vermont-based artist Eric Aho's large-scale paintings, Sheet and Drift. This painting is representational of many things. It's both, he says, about the feeling of coldness, as well as his associations with his ancestral Finland and Vermont. So it's multi-meaning. So he's really recording for us on the canvas his memories and his feelings about those memories, not so much a literal place. Viewers are meant to project their own memories and feelings associated with winter landscape uh, through these canvases. Nearby, another narrative invites viewers to contemplate winter through a more modern portal. I have a artwork that is yet to be completed in the exhibit, and that's Shelley Jackson's story titled Snow. She is an author artist. She uses Instagram as her medium. Well, what she first does is she's at one word at a time, goes around Brooklyn, and uses either her finger, finger or a twig and writes in one word in a precise font and that then she will photograph and share on Instagram. And that creates this beautiful story, um, a little whimsical, on the taxonomy of snow. The exhibit mixes work from contemporary artists with a number of pieces from the Shelburne Museum's permanent collection. That collection contains work by many familiar names, including one of the most well-known artists in history. One piece that is, you know, exciting for both myself and the other artists represented in the show is to have a Claude Monet painting mixed in. Um, so that is from our permanent collection. There's no better way to kind of investigate the effects of light than with an Impressionist master such as Monet. Before they leave, viewers have the opportunity to participate in the exhibit, creating their own short-lived art by playing a video game. The decidedly old-school look of the game is sure to evoke feelings of nostalgia for viewers of a certain age. 
this 8-bit avatar figure in this video game titled January, again, you move them across this barren, wintry landscape, and snow is increasingly falling. It's becoming a blizzard. And these snowflakes are different sizes and fall at different rates. And so what you do is you tip this little figure's head up and you catch a snowflake on the tip of its tongue. And depending on the velocity from which it's falling and its size, it is a different note or chord. So the viewers create their own works of art, these new compositions, as you stir these feelings of nostalgia, catching snowflakes on your tongue. Stirring feelings of nostalgia for winter's past and celebrating the beauty of the ice and snow that come with the season. At the Shelburne Museum, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. Thank you, Rebecca. The Art of Winter exhibit is on display at the Shelburne Museum through May 30th. The museum is also hosting a unique exhibit of duck and other waterfowl decoys. It's called Birds of a Feather, and that exhibit runs through June 19th. Our next segment delves into Vermont's rich Civil War history. More than 30,000 Vermont soldiers fought in the war and nearly 6,000 lost their lives. One of the deadliest but most important contributions by Vermonters was at the Battle of the Wilderness in Virginia. The Vermont soldiers held important ground, but to do so, more than a thousand of them lost their lives. Vermont's role in the war began with an historic vote in Montpelier, and that's where we find Vermont Civil War historian Howard Coffin, who has several tales of history to tell from our statehouse inside and out. Some interesting history happened on this statehouse lawn. A 100-foot flagpole was put up here as the war began, and war rallies were held around it. And then, at the end of the war, a scaffold was built, supposedly, for the hanging of Confederate President Jefferson Davis. We're in the Vermont House of Representatives, perhaps the most famous room in all of Vermont, and it looks today almost exactly as it did at the time of the Civil War. The same chandelier, the same seats, and the same speaker's rostrum. In 1862, John Phelps came back from Louisiana, having resigned from the Army after General Benjamin Butler refused to let him enlist black men into the Army. He came back and he spoke here to a rousing reception. He said, the sun never looked down upon a greater evil than American slavery. In ruling this great nation of slaves, we have to a degree become enslaved ourselves. Many of the things said here had a ring of human freedom. Perhaps the greatest moment in this room happened on May 9, 1865, when the legislature met in an extra session to consider whether to ratify the 13th Amendment, which outlawed slavery. The vote was 169 to nothing, and when the vote was announced, a 100-gun salute was fired on the State House lawn. Republican Governor Erastus Fairbanks asked the legislature to appropriate a half a million dollars to begin the war effort. But that wasn't enough, according to many, including Representative Stephen Thomas, a Democrat from West Fairley. He rose to say this, until this rebellion shall have been put down, I have no friends to reward and no enemies to punish. And I trust that the whole strength and power of Vermont both of men and money, will be put into the field to sustain the government. Thomas would go on to lead the 8th Vermont Regiment in the Civil War, including in its suicidal and brave stand at Cedar Creek. Soldier reunions were held in this hall, and years after the Civil War, Stephen Thomas came back, and he spoke of his comrades no longer with him. Their memory is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. They need no eulogy, for it is written in letters of living light. 
Abraham Lincoln had used the analogy of gold and silver to talk about the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, how they should always be considered together because the Declaration of Independence guaranteed that all men are created equal and should be treated equal, he was talking about human freedom. Here in the Senate chamber, all the seats are numbered. This has been called the most beautiful room in Vermont, and it may well be. After the Civil War, a war record was an essential thing to a political career and a lot of veterans got elected to the Senate. In fact, some 95 Civil War veterans served in this room. The numbers haven't changed. Here in seat 22 sat George Grenville Benedict, longtime editor of the Burlington Free Press, who won a Medal of Honor at Gettysburg. In the seat beside him, seat 23, Wheelock Vasey served from Springfield. Wheelock Vasey commanded the 16th Vermont Regiment at Gettysburg in the flank attack on Pickett's Charge and then turned his men around and launched another flank attack on a supporting Confederate attack. Long after the war, he became national commander of the Grand Army of the Republic, the great veterans organization. And right down at the end of this row, at the last desk, it was occupied by Redfield Proctor. Redfield Proctor, who led the 15th Vermont Regiment to Gettysburg, who later served as Secretary of War. Beloved by his soldiers, he welcomed them all to Proctor for a great reunion years after the war. In Proctor, he had founded the Vermont Marble Company. Vermont, of course, has a remarkable Civil War history, but it is nowhere as present, perhaps, as in the Cedar Creek Room of the State House. And an old friend of mine is with us today, David Sheets, the curator of the State House. David, there's some new things in this old room. There are. We've never been able to truly bring alive perhaps the two parts of the State House that resonate with the Civil War the most. And that's this room, the Cedar Creek Room, which of course has this magnificent painting behind us that was commissioned for the State House as perhaps Vermont's most important Civil War memorial. And then the flag collection, which we've worked for decades to conserve but in the aftermath of that, not been able to do much with the, the empty cases. So now we have these glorious uh, exhibits that actually, uh, with this significant anniversary for the Civil War, are coming alive in a new way for the State House, and we're very, very proud of them. In this room, we've never had a very effective way of explaining this this magnificent painting to the public unless they had the benefit of a tour. Um, we get so many casual visitors to the State House that we needed a more active way of bringing this to life. And as you know, we have now these wonderful stanchions in front of the painting that explain the battle and also explain the significant story of how Julian Scott actually painted the battle for this building. The Civil War lasted four years. We're in the middle of a four-year Civil War sesquicentennial. If you come to the State House in the next four years, you'll see these exhibits and understand Vermont in the Civil War. Our thanks to both Howard Coffin and State House curator David Sheets. And thank you for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.